Welcome to The Shark Pod, the podcast that explores business and lifestyle design in Ireland and beyond. And now, live from Greystone Studios, here are your hosts, Luke Curry and Mark Baker. What is up, Shark Nation? Uh, it's your host here, Luke, from live from Greystone Studios. I'm the only one that's in Greystones right now because of the, the madness that's going on out there in uh in, in the world with the the covid uh crisis that's going on um but we're not going to let that stop us we're gonna get our podcast on anyway and um, today we've got uh, a very very interesting guest Stephen uh, farrell uh, Stephen uh, is a speaker an artist a cancer survivor a podcaster and an nlp mind coach um today we're gonna have a chat with Stephen. we're also going to try to keep it as upbeat and uh, positive looking forward to the the future as we know a lot of people out there are perhaps um are perhaps going through some some tough times right now so how are you doing Stephen? good really really great and um, thank you guys for asking me on yeah absolutely and mark's here as well he's out there in glenagiri yeah i'm here all literally in this room all week <laughs> we're all we're all in isolation but but look uh, technology it's incredible we can we can link in although we're all in ireland we can link in and and chat and do this with technology it's amazing yeah it's amazing stuff and we we're, we're pretty like last week was our first time doing this and it came off pretty well we got some good feedback so that's all good and today we're even uh we're, we set, set it up even better so that's all good so uh mark how's your week did you have a, a busy one you're you're trying to keep the the company going there uh, yeah well yeah it was busy it was jesus it was busy it's, it's kind of busier than ever now i think everybody's busy in different ways though you know it's it's not business as usual totally it's it's you know it's setting up these kind of meetings making sure we we, we meet at 10 a.m virtually through microsoft teams we all have a chat uh you know, we had one of the lads doing, he, he said he could do 50 press-ups. So we said, right, off you go. <laughs> that, that, that's recorded. You know, little things like that to keep the morale up. Sure. Um, and uh, yeah, look, we're, uh, things are changing by the day, but I think everybody's, everybody's very positive as in like they're dying to get back to normal. And I think that's one thing you'll see when, when it blows over and hopefully without too many too many casualties and stuff like that like people will want to get back to to normal uh, very mm-hmm. very quickly Absolutely. so isn't it remarkable how adaptable we are though uh, humans yeah. and and how resilient we are as well but how much we adapt how quickly we can adapt i mean i see people now standing in queues outside of our um, multiples like our tesco's and our dump stores and, and super value and so on and they're standing with responsible and respectable distances between each other no aggro no antagonism Everyone is, is in relatively upbeat mood. And yeah, it's incredible. It's really, really interesting how humans can, can just adapt to things. Yeah, I was watching we were like the, the new season of Ozark. I don't know if you've watched that, but it, w- it was out last night. And I think at the start of it, he's, I don't know, it's a gathering of people. And I said to Kim, this makes me feel a little bit uneasy looking at this. Oh sure. my God, they're standing. It's amazing. Like you were like, you're kind of cringing going, what, you're all over each other. So you, hopefully it won't come to that, that we'll never you know, (laughs) connect ever again. But I definitely think it's amazing what you can adapt to. So quick, yeah. yeah. Gemma, Stephen, I was was saying to my wife as well last night that uh, like we were watching the news and it was Leo Radcar, he was doing his uh, his, his speech about some of the restrictions that are coming in. I I couldn't believe that his first speech on this was on St. Patrick's Day. It's not even April yet. And so much is crazy, you know? Um, But that's that's something we can do about that. We can only... uh, you know uh influence what we can influence and take from there do our best to like i said not to spread uh <laughs> not to spread this uh this terrible thing That's around it. yeah um but steven let's uh let's get let's <laughs> do a deep dive here a shark dive on uh on your, your um, any any shark puns or ocean puns or, or i'm well. the worst of puns i'm so bad at puns <laughs> so i don't even know if i'm doing them so if i do if i uh, have a pun tell me because i Absolutely. yeah i don't think I've, i'm great at puns at all well We'll let you know. So you get extra extra points. Uh, you get uh, so like you guys. You guys met, or at least you guys were in the same, I guess, uh, the, the same lane with the art. Um, mm-hmm. Back when Mark was kind of doing that full time as well. What, was that where you started your career, um, or is that where where you guys met each other, or how did you guys come across? We, we have we had met before. Um, I was I was aware of of Stephen True's work and just kind of being in that kind of broader circle. Ireland is a small world and so is the Irish art world. So that's, I kind of been following your stuff and then your story changed and, and, and led on to other things. So I've, I've kind of been watching you from afar. If that's, that's okay to say. Sure it is. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, thank you. 
I and, and then I think we we were following each other on on Instagram, and I commented on one of your your paintings, which are incredible, by the way. And it kind of flowed from there. And then more recently, you you linked in the time bits in with us, and here we are. Absolutely. And so, Stephen, the uh, I had a look at your your website before this because Mark told you told me you were coming on, and I want to get a bit of a background for you. Like it seems sure. like a really, really interesting story um, that you're you're you've gone through. Um, the like there's the the cancer survival stuff that led to I guess the inspirational speaking and uh, the podcast and all that type of stuff. But let's if we rewind the clock even back further, um, mm-hmm. when you were leaving school, what were you doing? What was the what was the story there? Uh, preschool, uh, like uh, back when I was in uh, was <laughs> back when I was born, oh. <laughs> back at birth. <laughs> We kind of left secondary school. What was the career path that you were kind of honing in on? What was the, what was the, the vibe there? Look, I, I guess at that point, and looking back now, with we're going to touch on NLP and how I use the tools that I've learned in NLP. Looking back from where I am now, I know why I was holding myself back from a lot of different things, but I also knew I wanted to be an artist, a visual artist or a painter. Okay. There was, as I was growing up, and I grew up in Dublin 24 in Tala, as I was growing up, I I was always inspired by an artist. We did. I didn't know any artists directly, but I I knew I loved one called Jim Fitzpatrick, who you guys might know from the Che Guevara and the iconic uh, Celtic. And Lizzie stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and he's become a friend of mine now, which is amazing. But he was definitely someone I I aspired to be like. But when I was growing up in Tala, it, it was challenging because my mom was raising three kids on her own and. There wasn't a lot of money for art materials, but she also always bought me the best she could. And then when I started working, I, I got the got the best I could. But I didn't really believe in myself or, or my abilities. And, and I was, I think we mentioned earlier, Mark, off, off air, the imposter syndrome was certainly there. And I, I didn't, I now talk about setting goals and the importance of structuring your goals and, and step by step and how to get to your, your end goal, your, your destination goal. But back then, I only knew what I wanted to be, but I didn't know how to get there. I went to Ballyfermot, which is a PLC college in, in Dublin, which was amazing. I, I, I took a year in, in Ballyfermot. I went to, to Greece. I, I spent a summer in Greece. was amazing. But again, no direction at all until I was about 20, oh, one or two maybe probably 22 and I met the man who then went on to become my husband and we're married now 13 or, or so years wow. and he motivated me yeah I, I, a long time ago we got married actually uh, Luke in, in Canada in Vancouver I know you live there and uh, yeah yeah it was amazing really amazing uh, there were residency requirements that really couldn't get married in Ireland at that point we didn't even have civil partnership at that stage Wow. But there were fewer residency requirements or they weren't as stringent as they were in, in other parts of Europe. So I think it was 48 hours residence in, in Vancouver as opposed to four weeks in Spain, maybe, or two weeks in, in the UK. Okay. But you, it just isn't practical, of course. So, so yeah, he, he, and I talk about the importance of, of your resources and, and people around you who, who will help you if you ask for help. And he helped me and motivated me, inspired me, encouraged me really to set up my first art exhibition, which was in 2007. And it flowed from there. It was pretty much a sellout. And then I was picked up by, I had my a solo shortly after that. I was picked up by one of Ireland's best known galleries, the Oriel Gallery on Clare Street, who sell incredible art from all over the world, really well-known artists, and then younger kind of artists and, and newer artists like me. And then it, it flowed from there. So so yeah, that was, that was 21, 22, 23, up to about 25, I suppose. So that kind of inspiration to actually grab the bull by the horns and uh, commit to good doing the the first gallery or the first uh, the first exhibition was that was that the kind of peak of imposter syndrome for you like you're saying or were you was there a little bit of when you're uh, younger you're kind of more not brash but you're a little bit more confident to see what, see what happens or was what was the the, the feeling around that? Um, I I suppose because of the support that I was getting, I went with the flow essentially. Mm-hmm. I still had a lot of imposter syndrome up to even recently, up until 2017. And my work from 07 over the course of those 10 years, my work was bought by a lot of people, but also very well-known people, diplomats, politicians, uh, rock stars, that kind of thing. And I still had the negative self-talk and, and limiting beliefs, it turns out, negative self-talk 
are they you know i'd ask myself things like why why do they like my work it's not good enough it's not really very good work are they blind that kind of thing or they're going to buy the painting bring it home and bring it back and that that took almost 2017 almost dying to uh really break that uh, limiting belief and negative self-talk so all the way through yeah it was a challenge very much so it's, it's crazy because as a so i'm the only one in this in this uh <laughs> Um, in this conversation who's not an artist <laughs> from the outside it seems like it wouldn't be the the type of uh, uh, occupation where you'd be really comparing yourself to other people because you're it's so your own lane you're, you're trying to do something different you're trying to you know express yourself but it, after talk, I've talked to Mark about this as well and you do uh, maybe not uh, compare yourself to the type of uh, work that people are doing but there is this kind of okay he's getting this or she's getting that that could have been me or that you know why would they pick that person over Is yeah it... and and i mean i think a lot of us do that in, in every industry in every career to a point and i don't anymore because i can only do the best i can do and no one can do it like me like no one can do what you do like you or or mark we all have our own individual voices but at that stage i would have been absolutely and a lot of people get caught up in the oh i'm not as good as this person and they're looking at people that might be I'm not as good a writer as J.K. Rowling is. Of course you're not, because you're only probably starting, but you might, you will get to a level that she's at, but you will have your own voice, your own way of doing it. And other people will be looking up to you and probably are at the moment. So rather than give ourselves a hard time and say we're not as good, just you can only go, you can only do the best you can do step by step, you know? I, th I think it's natural for people to kind of gravitate towards what successful people are doing. And in art, that's, you shouldn't really do that because it's supposed to be unique. So if you're trying to be like everybody else and you see some people, and especially younger artists, trying to be like other artists, you just become a, a poor man's, you know, Jim Fitzpatrick or a poor man's, you know, whatever. So that's not what you want. So you really have to fight against that in, in, in uh, art. Yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's about finding your voice and sometimes they can be nice um, foundations for you. I know certainly for me uh, as a kid, I would try to emulate his work uh, and mm. I've completely diverted from that. But I learned a lot from the, the fine line work that he does. So I, I brought that with me and, and there is a lot of learning by, by modeling other people, modeling what they do. I, I mean, nothing under the sun is new, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, the saying everything we're always learning from other people and we're always growing from what they do and and we're inspired by them but of course we're not plagiarizing we're not copying to a point of it being a, a, a poor man's version but mm. but learning from people is is your role we're learning all the time we're picking things up but but it's lovely to be able to to allow inspiration come from other artists or other creators and we're all creators at the end of the day i i believe absolutely so mark when you were like when you made the, when you were making uh, a go of it being uh, the artist full time, and where you did that for, I think it was just after you left college. Did yeah, you... it was for a year. That would have been two thousand and eight or something like that. I'd say two thousand seven, two thousand eight. Yeah, great time to start. The recession. Yeah, yeah well, 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 I suppose. Um, well, what do you think it was that that held you back? That held me back. Um, mm. I felt I gave it a hundred percent, and. Okay. It, I give, I, you can ask Luke, I tend to give things as much sure. effort as possible. Mm -hmm. And it didn't, I felt it didn't work. Well, it worked great. And it was, I couldn't paint fast enough for, for a few years. And sure. it was success after success for someone mm -hmm. probably 21, 22. Um, and then it just, nobody wanted to buy paintings anymore. And I had, I didn't adapt again to talking about adapting. Um, I didn't know how to adapt and I panicked sure. and I became an accountant and from then sure. on, but, but I thought I could keep it on the side all the time. And I did, and I had exhibitions and I've, I've done hundreds and hundreds of paintings alongside my full-time job. But there is a bit that of me that, that thinks, well, why didn't I go, why didn't I try harder? It's very hard. Like I, I'm not, uh, I'd never wanted to be a struggling artist. It was taking away the joy of it. It was, it was, it literally came down to income. That, that's all it was for me. You know? sure. yeah. yeah. I'm sure that gonna, that's going to, it's the reality for a lot, a lot of people as well. When they're trying to make it as an artist, there is rent to pay as well. So I'd say when you're, when Mark, when you were an artist for, like, for whatever time that you were doing it kind of full time, it's, 
maybe when you're saying giving a hundred percent, you're giving a hundred percent for that time. But had you given it a hundred percent and been able to kind of give up two or three years worth and that kind of struggler, you know, you might be in a different place. But like, like it's hard to say now because you're a successful life and everything now. <laughs> but uh, it's yeah, hard and back at the the kind of signposts along the way, you know. And and there's no point in you've done the best you could do certainly all the way through, and no point in giving yourself a hard time at all about what's happened in the past. And and yeah, sometimes it's priorities. And if your priority isn't creating work, it's it's paying your rent, or or if you had a young family at that point, I'm not sure. But priorities can be depending on where they are. It, it may just drift for a while, and it might come back into your life. Of course. You're always going to be able to do it. You're always going to be a creator. But at the moment, you had other things that were more important and, and they took precedence, of course. But in fairness, though, I, I do think, like some people think you're either an accountant or a solicitor or a doctor or an artist or a whatever. I was both. I, 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 I maintained, like from, I could do four hours a day at night, sure. you know, still doing art, along with yeah. being an accountant, along with doing exams. So if you want it bad enough, that was my view. I didn't have to, I didn't, I never gave it up. So that's that's how I kind of allowed myself to give to, to give it up full time was was to, to sure. do it part time, and it's a great message as well because you can find the time if it if it's something you want badly enough. It's an amazing yeah. oh, you know definitely. a lot of people will say oh I don't have the time and it's like well you 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 may not have the time but if you look at the other things you're doing and you can cut some of them out again back to priorities and prioritizing if it's a priority you'll find the time rather than spend four hours watching a Netflix documentary or whatever, which there's nothing wrong with that. But if you want to spend that instead and write your book or, or paint or become a photographer or do whatever, you can find the time in a lot of cases, just how you structure your day. I think it's human nature to put labels on people. Like we did it at the start with you there. We do it every podcast, you know, but you, you shouldn't really, you can be multiple things and, and, and you ended up, you know, doing multiple things and still do. Yeah. Yeah, and I think society is, is getting, is finding that easier, you know, in the, and in the past, the society we grew up in, you were, uh, you were in a box, you were labeled, and I, I don't like labeling at all, either, so we've come from a, a society that loves labeling, and it doesn't even love labeling, just would label you. you, you do this, this is what you do, you go home, you have your family, you do it again, this is what you are, you're a doctor, you're a factory worker, whatever. Whereas now we're moving into a society where the gig economy is a huge thing. Or, or I know that times at the moment are changing all of that, but maybe it'll become more of a thing going forward. But now we're, we're happier to not label people. Where, whereas you can say, oh, I do all of these things. I mean, politics was a big part of my life and still is. And I was planning on running in the last local election. So I, there's a lot of things that I love doing and we get one chance as far as we know we get one opportunity so why not try it all Absolutely. why would you spend your whole life being labelled and in a box and then get to the end and die in regret I have been on that deathbed and it's not a nice place to be so I, I, I'm not getting back to that place and not expressing myself and trying everything out so that's, that's a, message for, a message for everybody give it a go you don't know until you give it a go don't get to the end and wish you had because the end will come. Agree. Couldn't agree with you more, Stephen, on that. Um, I think that people should be doing more kind of different things. It gives you a richer life as well. So, like oh me. my God, it rounds you, it really does. So let's actually let's 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 have a chat about to, what happened to you in 2017 because this is something that you know goes to the the heart and soul of everyone that's listening as well. That kind of mm-hmm. the fear of it's it's something like we're talking about. You mentioned kind of the the deathbed, the the regrets, everything like that. It's something that it's in the background all the time. And no one is ever. It's like it were, It's like <laughs> sweeping it under under the rug. It's like the it's like the Curry family. Uh, Mark, you know, we just sweep everything under the rug. We don't talk about things, right? So <laughs> the it, it's something that I think everybody listening uh, has has thought about probably on their own a lot, but not really talked about uh, out loud. Um, maybe let the les- listeners know um, the the kind of the struggle that you had or the 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 event in your life that was kind of changed changed you and put you on this this new path of trying to inspire people through speaking and stuff you know uh when i'm when i'm asked about it and and even when i'm speaking about it but just before i speak i hear the voice of brené brown in my head and because what i always preface everything with is everyone goes through challenges and this wasn't you know i'm not i'm not looking for the poor me and then i hear brené brown say say 
don't rank your suffering, Stephen, because we do that. You know, uh, oh, you know, I nearly died, but Joan up the road has no legs or head and her head's rolling out the street. You know, that kind of thing. So I do preface it by saying, and we're remarkable. We really are. Back to, um, I'll circle back to the start and, and say, we are incredibly adaptable. We were, I'm really resilient. Every single person listening has gone through a challenge. A different one to mine, of course, naturally, but they've been knocked down. And sometimes when they're knocked down, they, they try to get back up and they're knocked down even further, further than they ever thought they could fall. But they still get back up. And we will get through this period, of course, where we're going through COVID-19 at the moment. But for me, I was going from 07, my first art exhibition, 10 years later, 2017, September 11th, actually. I'd been the healthiest and, and the, the, the most successful, really. And success isn't really, it's not that big of a deal to me or what do you consider success, I suppose. And the, the, the healthiest I ever thought I was, I, well, at least I thought I was healthy at that point. It turns out I wasn't so healthy. But was that when you were in the CrossFit cult? Oh, man, I was CrossFit. I was cycling. I was vegetarian. I didn't drink. I didn't do drugs. I still don't do any, a lot of those stuff, uh, things. But yeah, CrossFit was a huge part of my life. And I loved it. And I'm no longer in the cult, unfortunately, because I can't be. And I'll cover that in a few moments. But um, that's more to do with my health. So... So yeah, September 11th, I, we'd never spoken about cancer in our family. No one ever had cancer, aunts, uncles, grandparents, cousins, nobody. And again, really, really healthy. So I'm steadily going through life. It wasn't too hot. It wasn't too cold. I was really inspired. I was selling paintings, the kind of usual stuff. Selling the odd painting and, and creating work and stuff. And I'd become a bit lazy, I guess, in my life and in my output and what I was doing. And then, because I thought I was going to live forever, and I think a lot of people do this, you know, well, we, logically, we know we're going to die, but we really don't think we're going to die. Yeah. So that was me. I thought I was... Uh, I don't think uh, it's going to do that. And I, yeah, and, I, and a really strong guy. Never had more than a cold in my life. And then I, I had been referred to St. Vincent's uh, uh, Public Hospital, which is only up the road from my house, as, as I direct uh, point to it. And the, my dermatologist or, or the, the woman who will go on to become my amazing dermatologist consultant sat across from me and she told me I had metastatic melanoma or at least at that point it was melanoma. And she's drawing on a, on a piece of paper what that means or what it looks like in the body and the skin. I had no idea what she was talking about. So then she said to me, you might have to have a surgery on your groin. And usually when I'm talking to people about this, I say, has anyone ever had a baby given birth? Or... Because that's full on right down there. For me, even the thoughts of possibly having to have a surgery on my groin. Again, I've never had more than a cold in my life. I pass out. I woke up on the floor. Oh my <laughs> so my ego, you know, any ego that I might have had at that point, I was, the ego was squashed between my 12, 13 stone body. But again, I got back up, like I, I said, we all do. And it turns out that I, I, it, it, we thought it was a stage one cancer at that point. I didn't know it was a cancer until I got back up and, and we started to talk through it after me passing out. And it turns out then I had a, a stage three cancer. So it had to travel yeah. through to my lymphatic system. And, and that wasn't the worst of it. I mean, it did get worse, but, but that was September, October, 2017, about two and a half years ago. Wow. And after you woke up, did you, was it kind of, did you go through the di like different stages where you kind of like didn't believe it? Do you want a second opinion or were you like, okay, how do we fix this? You know, was there, what was the, what was the feeling straight away? Was, yeah. And, and, and I talk about this now because uh, a lot of people find it hard when they're going through a crisis and a trauma and, and how to um, get through it and, and what tools to use. And, and I look back now and say, what did I do? And there was one day that I was sitting in this room, actually, and I remember saying to myself, only once, why me? And the answer was, well, why not you? Why should it be anybody else? Why not you? And of course, you're going to get through. And if you can't get through, if you don't get through, and that, that was an early stage in, in the diagnosis. And for people listening who don't know what metastatic melanoma is, and I, again, I didn't, it's the most deadly form of skin cancer it's an incredibly deadly form of cancer. It, it's, a, it's a huge killer and it's on the rise in Ireland, unfortunately. But, but yeah, it's, 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 you look like you're going to ask them there. 
Yeah, because it's I'm interested in these types of things as well. Um, Hypochondriac, like I am, Mark, as you know. Um, no. <laughs> um, the, with, with that type of cancer, is that the same one that uh, a lot of Irish people are of Irish descent in like um, Australia get and stuff? Is it is it from get, like being exposed to sun, or is it just a random thing? What's the do, do they give you any feedback like that, or do they have? Yeah, it? so it's environmental, and and people all over the world get it, and of course in places that are sunnier, and of course people who are lighter skin are more prone to it. But it, anybody can get it. A, a guy linked in with me recently, an African American who had it and tip, actually typically African-Americans get it on the palms of their hands or on their feet, the soles of their feet. So it, anyone can get it. And Bob Marley actually died from it on the 11th of May, which is my birthday a couple of years before I was born. 11th of May is my birthday. In no way. That is. That is so mad. <laughs> wow. Anyway, that is, uh... Yes, that is so random. Yeah, I'll, s- I'll send you a present uh, on your birthday. Yes, I will. I will send Maybe you one too. Maybe it's a, a shark pod t-shirt. We're not sure, Mark. We'll see. If a... I'd love yeah. one. Oh, boys. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, and, and Luke, tell me, are you wearing medium or large? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm wearing uh, large today. I, did you miss the last one? Mark was having yeah. a go. I got, the, I got the large one on. I've been trying to be good, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's swimming on you. It's swimming. Yeah. Ah, fun, right? <laughs> there you go. Fun? <laughs> you said you had none in the tank. You know, yeah, you were doing your shop this morning, Luke, and uh, uh, Stephen, he says to me, it's just a li- little shopping is, is more expensive today. I think they're, they're putting up the prices. Or is it the fact that I've packed, up, packed in a lot of uh, chocolate? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that would be it. That would be it. <laughs> All the when you're, you know, we never, don't know where this, this is going. You know, you gotta, you gotta stop. <laughs> we all cope in different ways. Yeah, exactly. But Mark keeps me honest, which is good. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, so... so Speak, sorry, Steve, speaking about coping, like I'm always wondering how, how do you cope with that? Like, how do you, how do you, how do you, with a diagnosis like that? Well, it's about choices and you choose to make the most out of it or bury your head in the sand like the ostrich and look on the bright side. And and gratitude has always been a big part of my life and how blessed I am in my life. I I mean, I did a challenging. In points, challenging upbringing, um, uh, lots of love and kindness, of course, at home. But uh, mom raising three kids in working class area, there was there were elements of, of challenge. A young gay man in that area as well. Although I have a lot of friends who still live there, and I, I was very well known and personable and liked in the area. But that brought its own challenges as well. And yeah, so I I. And I'm thankful for all of them and very grateful. And then my life went from Dublin 24 to Dublin 4 for anyone in Ireland will, will kind of know the metaphors I'm using there. But I, yeah, I've always been very grateful, even for my challenges, uh, my dad leaving when we were kids and uh, young teenagers. But without those challenges, I wouldn't have been able to get through the crisis that I then went through in 20. 2017 into 2018 because it did get worse than just the diagnosis and all of the surgeries and all of the treatment involved in that and I got sicker than that as well but I yeah I think it definitely is helping me now but but again back to I, I said earlier I, I'm now looking back on what did I do and a lot of things I did one of the amazing things is is how do I frame the situation how do I look for I can choose to put a bad bad frame on it so everything's negative and everything's terrible. Or I can look at it and say, okay, there are elements of it being terrible, of course, and that's important as well. I talk about it as being feeling beings, and it's important to not go around with rose-tinted glasses on all the time. It's, it's not natural. It's not normal. I had sad moments. I didn't have sad day. You know, a lot of people say, I'm having a bad day. And I'd say, well, I'm sure there are certain parts of it that were good. And they'll say, well, yeah. I mean, we're breathing is number one. And then I'll say, so it's not a bad day. You're having bad moments, but it's not a bad day. So let's not wipe your whole day out. So if you look for the good parts, you will find them. But again, it doesn't mean the bad parts aren't there. So, so yeah, it's about framing the situation. What are the good points in this? One of the good points is I'm going in and out of hospital. A lot of people go in and don't get back out. I mean, that, that, that's one of them. So it's really about um, having a toolkit that will help you. And one of my talks that I give it gives a, a toolkit of how to get through a crisis. Now, this can be used for businesses. It can be used for individuals. And one of them is asking for help is so important. I mean, me or accepting help as well. 
uh, there was one evening that I was here uh, in my house and I was really, really, really sick and I wouldn't accept help from one of my brothers-in-law. He was in Ireland and I wouldn't accept his help. I had to go to hospital. Turns out I had sepsis, uh, really, really bad. Yeah. Um, sepsis is blood poisoning. And I wouldn't allow him help me. And back, back to Brené Brown, who I love, uh, vulnerability. And I didn't, I didn't want to allow myself to be any more vulnerable than I, I had, had to allow myself to be. I'd never, be, again, ever been sick. Then I go from never being sick to really sick. Surgeons, oncologists, dermatologists, all of the teams in the hospital really wiped out, not able to move. And then my brother-in-law, one of them, really like it was really hard for me, the, the macho guy, to accept any more help than I had at that point. So, so yeah, asking for help is, a, is an important one. Uh, believing in yourself, believing in your voice and do, doing it no matter what you think other people are thinking about you. So all of these tools can, can really help through, through any crisis. And, and I was using them unknown to myself. They were just something that I'd, I'd learned uh, as a young guy, uh, as a young teenager and something that I just automatically started to use. So it became a habit. So I suppose like habit formation happens in the prefrontal cortex. Once you form it, it goes to the basal ganglia in the back of your head, it's there forever. So I was just using it in second nature, I suppose. So now I'm sharing that with people. Very good. It's such an interesting thing as well. Like you're, like you said, you're a young man, you're going through, you're a crossfitter, and then you need to, you probably need help to move around at that stage. Um, so with the with, with the 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 kind of recovery, how long did it take before you you were back? You're still such a young. How old were you actually when you got this this news? I forget how old I am now. The whole time, it's so funny. I, I often say to my husband, "Am I thirty six or 37? And he's like, "How do you forget what age you are?" It's like because it's not that big of a deal. Number one. So yeah. I used to tell people I was thirty five. Well, what age was I? I was thirty five when I got sick. I was thirty four. Thirty four. In and around that age, that's the kind of yeah. age range. <laughs> it's such a, a crazy, crazy age. There's like, like we've talked about on the podcast before. My uh, dad died when he was 34, which is crazy. Wow, so crazy. Some, it's something that's always been in my mind as well. That it's that can be a little bit closer than a lot of people think. You know. Sure. So yeah. after after you did this, um, after you went through this, was it like a year, 18 months before you got back on your feet? How long did it? Um, I was still working throughout the period. I mean, I, I, I'd committed to a few different things. One was a charity, actually funny story. One was a charity event. And the first time I'd sepsis, so I'd sepsis twice. The first time I had sepsis, I was in ICU and I'd committed to a Syrian charity. What is it called? Whatever the charity is called. And I was giving them maybe four or five small paintings, kind of that size, but they hadn't been framed. And I persuaded somehow my husband to get the frames and the paintings and a drill into me in ICU and I was trying to drill and I, got, and I was attached to monitors on the wall and I couldn't leave the bed and I was I had stuff coming out of my arms and stuff and I hadn't got the strength to to drill the, the paintings into the frames but that was coming up to Christmas of 2017 it was probably a few months later that I was I was back I was I was incredibly fit, and this is a big plug for CrossFit. It, it had my body at a level that it would, and obviously cycling, and I ho went horse riding five days a week and eating healthily and not drinking. All of that helped me recover faster than if I had other not as good habits, I suppose. Um, so, yeah, I bounced back really quickly. Even my surgeon was like, wow, you're healing really uh, I was vegetarian, I think I mentioned at that point, and I'm a vegetarian again now, but what, one thing that my surgeon said to me was, you need really high quality protein, because I had two major surgeries. Well, actually, I had nine surgeries in total, but two at this period. One on my lower back called, called a wide local excision, where they take a kind of a rugby ball um, shape uh, piece of skin from the original cancer site to see if there was any cancer in the, the surrounding tissue, and there wasn't, luckily. And then I had what's called a groin dissection. So the maybe having a groin surgery, I actually had two and one was small and one was nine inches long of digging into my groin and taking out all my lymph nodes. And lymph nodes are like clusters. We've clusters all around our body under our arms and our necks and stuff. Amazing. Our, our lymphatic system is incredible. But they had to take my lymph nodes out to see if I had cancer because there was cancer in the sentinel lymph node. And my surgeon said, you're going to, he said, now, I know you can get protein from being vegetarian. I get that. 
but you need really high quality protein. So I had my first burger that day in the hospital and it came from a place up in Family Man's called Boojum, I think. And yeah, so, so that was, that kind of helped my recovery as well, the, the high quality protein, I believe at least. I know some people will probably object and say you can still get it from vegetarian sources. And I know that I do it now, but for me, that helped my recovery as well as the level of fitness I was at before I got sick. This is something so important as well because the I think people miss the miss the point of of being in you know the best shape they can be, and um, because they think that okay, um, I'm doing this so I don't get sick. Maybe it's also uh, you know everyone you know unfortunately gets sick at some stage, and but if you're in the best shape you can be, it's going to be either a better prognosis a lot of the time uh, and also mm-hmm. recovery. You can't really yeah. argue against that. I would say. And that's it. I talk about the importance of what we take into our mouth and what we take into our mind. So if you're you're healthy in, in body and mind, I think that can definitely help you through any challenge, you know. Um, so, yeah, it's and, kind of two different parts. And did, did the arts play any part in helping you uh, mind-wise recovering? Yeah, huge amount. and always has. And even when I was a younger guy, when I was 12, 13, 14, growing up in, in the area I grew up in, I was so unconfident. Now, if this was because I thought people were going to think a certain thing about my work and, and I was afraid of showing them what I was creating. The reality is I never know what people are thinking. And, and the fact is they're probably thinking good things or they're probably not thinking about me at all, actually, it's a fact. But back then, I was so concerned about what other people might think about me. So I would draw and uh, sit down. When everyone had gone to bed in the house, I'd go down to our living room and I'd sit by the fire and I'd draw. And then I burned the work, but it was allowing me to express my feelings. You know, dad left the house, uh, I'm gay, but I don't want to be and all those kind of things. It was allowing me to express those feelings. And I was then afraid of showing anyone I was burning it, but I was still expressing myself. So rather than holding it in and bottling it up, creativity allowed me to, to express that. And then as I was getting older, it helped me through, through any challenge I was facing in, in my life. And then certainly when I was when I was sick and, and the recovery process and my my work changed significantly actually it had gone from really pop arty paintings of dogs kind of like this yeah I remember that yeah. finished Very good. Um, which I love but really pop arty um, inspired by the dogs in Hollywood and and London and New York and that kind of thing in Dublin as well some great dogs around Dublin and I was at that point I loved what I was painting but I was painting what I thought other people wanted. And always did. And I don't know if you did this, but when I was diagnosed, when I was sick and when I really had a chat with myself one evening, I was in a hospital not knowing if I was getting out. I then started now paint what I want to paint. Turns out people like it, but I'm doing what I want. And I don't care what other people want or not. This is about my expression and me expressing myself. And my work became really, really abstract and, and really bright and full of gold leaf and full of really rich, warm tones exactly how I was feeling inside for the majority of, of the time because I'm so blessed and grateful to be here and actually a, a point of gratitude I am so grateful not only now of course but back then to the medical system in Ireland I had no private health insurance I didn't pay pretty much a cent uh, I do through my taxes of course but I I'm so grateful to my health the health system my fellow taxpayers who fund the system that saved my life and even more so now, the people on the front line who are in all industries, of course, in the front line, but in the health service, they're working. And one, unfortunately, passed away yesterday. Yeah. And they do amazing work. I'm so grateful for that. I wouldn't be here today if, I, if I'd been diagnosed in another part of the world, the USA, for instance, I would be probably stage four or dead. So without the system we have, I'm so grateful for that. I mean, I can't, you know, I talk about it all the time. It's really important to say. Absolutely. And I think we, because we have such a high standard, like in our mind for healthcare, we don't really compare ourselves with some other places. Like I said, mm-hmm. maybe USA in that case, if you don't have health insurance, it's not a, it's not a, good, a good thing. Um, sure. And also I, I live in Canada for on and off for nine years and they've got a, a very good system as well. If they were ever, I was ever sick. And sometimes I see them uh, like on American podcasters and stuff. Uh, they talk about how Canada's, the health system isn't as good as people say it was always really really good when i was there i don't know 
and you're a hypochondriac, so you're probably there every second day, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have this itch, and I have this sore head. Go <laughs> home, yeah. Luke. Yeah, exactly. So I had a, uh, I had a medical card growing up, and um, sure. I had it until I was 20, 23, because I was in college till then. Um, and so, uh, you know, having a free healthcare completely for, for someone who couldn't really afford, uh, you know, a high level of insurance growing up, it was an amazing thing. And so we should pat ourselves on the back a little bit for that. We also, like, we have to be, be realistic as well. Like there's, there's places where we can improve and all that type of stuff. Oh, of course. Uh, it's not a perfect system, but, but then again, what is perfect? It, it is, there's a lot of, um, my oncologist, John Crown, you might've heard him recently. He's on former senator, but he's, he's uh, even before then, he's uh, works in oncology and trained in Sloan Kettering. And he's one of the most, um, the best trained in terms of melanoma in, in Ireland, if not the best. And he does a lot of lung cancer work as well. But John Crown would be, would, would often challenge the H- HSE and the Department of Health because there are some failings there, a, a lot of failings. But there's also incredible things and they save lives every day, all the time. They're doing it right now as we speak, actually. Yeah, the people, I think, are so impressive. It's, yeah, it's a real vocation. It's, a re- it's real work. <laughs> even, even just when the kids were born in Hollis Street, just seeing the hours that they put in and how important the work is at every minute it's and then you go back to your office and you're just thinking yeah okay <laughs> is this well, as, you, as you say that uh, i'll give you a laugh so hollow street for listeners outside of ireland or outside of dublin is a maternity hospital of course i am now getting my because the hse is so backed up i'm getting my scans so i've never well i won't be getting it in a few weeks but i i get my scans in hollow street now so the joke is i'm going into hollow street for my scan <laughs> i'm not pregnant i'm not pregnant P- pillow but, under your uh, top Really, you know? surprise people. <laughs> uh, way gone. But I, I now get my, my scans in Hollis Street. So okay. I, I'm due a CT and, a, and an MRI. So when you get diagnosed with, a, with uh, as far as I know, at least, certainly with melanoma, with a cancer like that, a late stage cancer, uh, mine would be considered very high risk as well, recurrent. But you're monitored for five years, and that's every three months for the first two or three years. And then it goes to every six months if if you're doing okay. So so what does what does life look like for you now when it comes to physical activity and monitoring the situation? Yeah, so uh, one of the one of the downsides, and this this is why I don't uh, go to CrossFit anymore. And for anyone who knows anything about CrossFit, it's very functional movement and it's amazing, but very much lower body, and a lot of squats, a lot of lunges, deadlifts, all that kind of thing, all the all the stuff I love. But I, the, the groin surgery I had, the, the groin dissection, one of the possible downsides to that could be a thing called lymphedema, which is the swelling of the limb. And it doesn't happen in all cases, but unfortunately it is a potential. And the more, so I've no lymph nodes in my left groin and muscle pumps lymph fluid around your body. Imagine you had a road and suddenly the traffic's flowing nicely and suddenly you took a chunk out of the road and the traffic backed up and backed up and backed up. Mm-hmm. This is what happens to lymph fluid. So the lymph fluid then needs to find some secondary roads to get to where it was going or, or to join back up or whatever. For me, the challenge is my body, it could swell and it is irreversible. And one of the downsides of that is lymph fluid is very high in protein. Bacteria loves protein. If I get a cut on my left leg at all, I have to start taking antibiotics, which I bring everywhere with me in the world. Very small price to pay, but it can lead to sepsis. And that's why I got sepsis, they believe, twice. So I can't do anything serious like uh, any of the CrossFit movements, unfortunately. Okay, so are you just in cycling or is that what the, or what's, the, what's the protocol right now? Yeah, so cycling's great for it. Uh, walking's great. Uh, swimming's great. Horse riding's good as well. Um, you're not really using your leg a lot. It's just the position it's in. I have to keep my leg elevated as, as often as possible. When I'm flying, I have to put on compression. So I don't, you know, we all swell when we fly our feet, certainly. If you take off your shoes, you put them back on. They don't always fit. But that's great. Um, for me, I have to have really, really strong compression. And actually, I have double compression. And it's really painful. Uh, you know, I, I could wear it in CrossFit. I, I used to wear compression, but it's so tight. Yeah. It's painful. But again, it's a small price to pay. I'm still alive and breathing. But it is one of the, the possible, it, it, it has an impact on my health. Fitness rather than health. And so when you're, 
at what stage do you say, okay, you're like I said, you're using painting to kind of keep your your mind healthy while you're while you're uh, convalescing. When when do you say, okay, this is what I want to do now? I want to uh, get out there, uh, do speaking engagements. That's something that you always wanted to do, or is it that you did started beforehand? What what was the trigger there? Because a lot of people um, public speaking is like it's. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, they say it's one of the biggest fears. So I'm always interested to talk to people that are doing this as a profession. You know? Sure. I love it. I love being on stage and I have a history in theater and, and drama and performing and I have a teaching diploma for teaching drama to people as well. So I had that background anyway. My, my husband is the director, one of the directors of the National Performing Arts School, which is Ireland's largest, largest performing arts school and very much a theater family as well. And so it it was always something I was interested in. And then I had this urge to share my story because I, I noticed that people were finding it hard to get back up when they were knocked down. Although they did get back up, they were finding it challenging. And for me, I, I knew I had tools that I could use to help them. So that's what I talk about. That's what the, the podcast is, is about. That's what my talks are about. They're all about, they're all uplifting but they're practical tools that people can use in their daily lives. It's not just, I do talk about me, but it's not only about me. I do talk about other examples and other cases and other people because people have stories. But really what the focus of my speeches and my talks are is giving people tools they can use in their own lives. It's about them. It's not about me at all. So just the challenges I've faced have shown me what I can do and then how I can share that with people and how they can get through their lives. So, so that's, I guess, where speaking came into it. It's, it all kind of evolved uh, at the same kind of time, to be honest, because I also teach workshops on mindset or goal setting um, or creativity as well. And I consult with companies and, and businesses on that. And it, it, I was at a point in my life where I knew I had so much potential and we all do every single person out there. But I got to a point in my life where I hadn't fulfilled it. And I was lying in my hospital bed with sepsis for a second time and attached again, attached to walls. And they had to monitor my fluid intake and out, output. And I wasn't allowed to go to the toilet. I had to pee into a, a thing. So, and I had to get, I was on drips and I was on intravenous antibiotics, broad spectrum at the start to find out, you know, it was, it was a lot going on. And I realized that if I died at that point, and I could have very easily, it would have been the most painful death imaginable, mentally painful and probably physically. But the reason for it being mentally painful was because I hadn't fulfilled my potential and I hadn't done all that I knew I could do. So I'd been, I said earlier, I was lazy and that's, that's pretty hard to say, but I, I was, I mean, that's the reality of it. I know why I was lazy, limiting beliefs and, and value systems that weren't aligned and, and bad habits. But I, I, at that point said, you know what? you're going to give it a go and you're going to try whatever you want and you're going to do it no matter what you think other people are thinking. And now I don't care what people think about me or what they say about me or what they, they, number one, because I never know. Even if they tell me, I still don't even know. So if they tell me they think it's shit, I don't even know if they do because I don't know what goes on in people's heads. I don't know what goes on inside mine. I'd love to be able to teach that to to children, you know, that, that kind of mentality because especially even teenagers as they become teenagers, Mm -hmm that's it's all about what people think of them but it's it's very hard to you tell yeah, them oh, I, don't worry about what people say but they do right. yeah and, and it's understandable i suppose and, and it's how we survived because mm. we're we're tribal and community based and we, we don't want to be different from our community and, and back to being cave people uh, men and women it, we didn't want to be kicked out of the cave essentially because we we were disagreeing with or different from everybody else we don't like difference at all. Mm. I, I talk about the importance of diversity in companies and businesses. And we see a lot of the, the multinationals in Dublin are big into diversity. It's so important for, for innovation and creativity and, and progression. But humans aren't, haven't evolved really yet. We're getting there, but we don't really like diversity. We should, but we don't really. So to be able to stick your head up above the parapet and say, well, actually, I think this. People don't like that because it's uncomfortable as well. So, so teen- but we, we mirror, we're geniuses at mirroring what we see at home and modeling what the behaviors and modeling people around us. And this, this works into our goal setting as well because it can really be beneficial. But kids are mirroring all the time. They're picking up their belief systems from the, the parents or people in authority and uh, their peer group as well, of course. And they're picking up their value systems as well because we're not born with those. So it, it is, 
it is about, there's a great guy, I'm sure you guys know, who I, I love, such a lovely guy, Pat Ively, who has a great podcast as well. And I think the one... It, I never, I never heard of Pat uh, Divley, do you mind? Oh, he's so yeah, I've, I've heard of him. Yeah, I've seen some of the stuff, yeah. Yeah, yeah he's a good guy. Um, he, he does seminars all over the country and has a great podcast. And, and one is about knowing who you are. And once you know who you are, and it's easy for us to say as adults, and it is mm. a challenge for younger people, of course, and uh, I'd be there myself. But once you know who you are, it doesn't really matter what anyone says about you or to you or anything. Once you know who you are, it's so important. And, and getting to that point, uh, look, it's not easy. It took me nearly dying to get to that point. But I know who I am. I know what I'm doing. I know why I'm doing it. And I don't really care what people say. This is about helping people. And it's about leaving something behind when I inevitably will die and, and do die. Because, again, I didn't think I was going to. Um, but, yeah, it can, it can be hard to get to that. <laughs> And so the, one of the other things that I thought was interesting as well is the, the NLP, the Neuro Linguistic Programming. Like I came across that, that concept when I was probably, uh, probably like 12 or something. I was reading a Tony Robbins book that my mother uh, gave me. And it was one of the, one of the, the ones, that, one of his first ones. It was probably from the early 90s or something like that. Awaken the Giants Within, I think was his first one. Yeah, it could have been, could have been that one. Um, and it's Actually, I have it on my shelf. Uh, Ultimate Power is another one. Yeah, it's, it, yeah, great tools. He's and uh, it's been a, he's been a big influence on me and uh, kind of everyone in my family. We're a very Tony Robbins uh, based family. Sure. <laughs> but, uh, but one of the interesting things is the kind of the subconscious mind, I guess. You know, t- taking control of that, taking ownership of what you're putting in there, what you're feeding it. Is that kind of what uh, NLP is about, or what, in your opinion, opinion would you say is that kind of? Yeah, so uh, NLP would would suggest that, and it was developed, and it was it's a toolbox, but it was developed from a few different people. But the the main people who developed it were Richard Bandler and John Grinder, and they they studied people like Milton Erickson, who is a hypnotist, or that's actually look into Milton Erickson. He's more than a hypnotist, and it kind of diminishes the work that he does and, and the, the genius that he was. Um, Virginia Satir, who was a therapist, uh, and they looked into that and they, they looked at the best parts of, of different models and they said, okay, how are we going to combine all of this together to help people? And it's an amazing key to a toolkit that we all have inside of ourselves help, uh, that can help us to become the people that we want to become. So I, I love the book um, called The Alchemist by uh, Paolo Coelho. Um, and essentially, one of the metaphors that they use is the kid had to go through all these trials and troubles and travel the world to find the treasure that was beneath his head at the start of the book. And essentially what it means is the treasure is inside of it. So it's about getting the key to unlock the toolbox that we all have. So we all have all of the resources that we need, but sometimes we just don't know that we know that they're there. So it's being shown them and they're some of the tools that I share. So NLP uses a few different uh, techniques as well. And, and some of them, uh, hypnosis for one, is amazing for getting into the subconscious mind and really affecting change really quickly. And NLP is really quick. So rather than go to a, a therapist, and if, if anyone is, I think it's amazing. Actually, I think more people are talking about it now as well. Um, go to your therapist, of course. I'm not saying don't, but NLP can do certain things. We, we look to the future more so than look at the past. And a lot of therapy will look at the past, but we can do it really, really quickly. So we can help you overcome limiting beliefs or, or other blocks that might be in your way or your value system might be holding you back, looking at your values and, and just giving you practical tools that you can use to get to the goal that you want, or at least to get you on the pathway because you can divert. Of course, you don't have to continue on doggedly until the end. It's interesting as well. So they, it, it kind of, it's kind of a link into, uh, into goal setting as well. We talked about goal setting a few times uh, over the last few weeks, Mark, uh, in, our, in our podcast, especially when we were on our own um, at the very beginning. Um, what's the, if, if there's people out there who are going to have a little bit more time on their hands, maybe uh, locked in their house for <laughs> the foreseeable future. It's a, it's, it's a lock in, not a lockdown. Uh, David McWilliams said, yeah, you sounds better <laughs> when you say lock in. <laughs> <laughs> like a bit mischievous with a lock-in. I, I quite like that. Uh, look, if I said to you two years ago, would you love two weeks off that you can sit down and watch Netflix? All that you'd be jumping at it. Of course I would. And now, now people, because they're being given it, they're like, I'm decided yeah. on it. I don't want it. <laughs> it's such a. It's, that's, that's the thing. It's like it's almost like uh, someone said in the news. Just treat it like a kind of a like the two-week Christmas break where you don't really do much anyway. Just do lots of celebrations. Or, 
yeah, whatever. Um, but a lot of people are going to have some time in their hands. And what, what I've been trying to do is say, okay, where, cause I, I like, I love hiking. I love being outside. So me sure. and my wife, we, we go do things all the time that are more than two kilometers from the house. So it's going to be a little bit different for me. So I'm trying to, I was talking to Mark last night about this and I was talking about trying to uh, get better over the next two weeks or ho- however long we're going to be in here, get better at something. So um, sure. what I've tried to do is I'm going to upscale in um, like so- software applications that I work with and work, all that type of stuff um, to be more kind of a technical uh, person. Um, so the, is that, is that, would you say that's kind of a good goal to have? Is that not, what is there, uh, maybe this is the wrong way to put it. Is there good goal setting or bad goal setting or what would be the, the, the elements that would make up a good uh, set of goals or a good set of uh, kind of aspirations to to nail down. Yeah. I think using the next two weeks as a, as an example of how you could apply goal setting would be a good, Mm -hmm. good thing to talk about. Well, it depends on what people want. So Mm -hmm. is it a good goal? Well, what does that mean to you? It it could be a good goal for you. It may not be one for me. So it depends on what you want and, and how you want to grow and the time period as well. Two weeks is not a lot of time. I mean, we're going to be out of this in no time. I think it's going to stretch on longer, to be to be honest with you. But even if it does, three weeks, four weeks, it's not a lot of time. So number one, don't set yourself this huge goal that you're going to give yourself a hard time for in two weeks when you don't get it. So I want to write a thousand word novel. Uh, if you don't do that, have you ever written one before? Number one, if you haven't, it's a huge goal in two weeks. Don't you know you're going to end up probably dreading going to your keyboard or your computer and then in two weeks you're going to give yourself a a hard time and say you know what I knew I couldn't do it the fact is if the goal is for something in the next two weeks depends on what the goal is let's look at your destination goal so your destination goal is what's two weeks from now whatever the calendar date is two weeks from now what do I want to achieve that's my destination okay that's what I want I want to write a chapter of a book what do I need to do in the 14 days from now until then? So break it down. So what's a chapter of a book? Uh, say it's 14 pages, it's sim- simply. Every day I'm gonna write a page of a book. So that's your goal. So you got your journey goals, you got your destination goals. This is where I wanna to get to and this is how I'm gonna do it. So it's about breaking it down. Back when I was an art- wanted to be an artist, I knew what I wanted. I knew what my destination was. I just didn't know how to get there. I hadn't broken it down into journey. So it took longer than it should have taken. So when the, it took me quite a few years from when I was a kid. Actually, I, I got a book and it's here beside me. When I was in, in growing up in Tala, uh, I'd, I'd love to know how I found this book because 15 or 15 from a store in the UK, a place called Wakefield. And the store was called the Pentagram in Wakefield. You know the song Saturday Night. I'm not going to sing it, but uh, Wakefield's a band. But oh. I have no idea how I, I came across this book. And again, I'd love to know but it was about visualization and setting goal setting. So at that point, I, I knew practically how to do it, but I didn't really believe it would work. So for what should have taken me a year or two to become an artist and, and to start selling work, it took me 10 years or so, from 12 to 22, give or take. So, so by using the tools and breaking it down into bite-sized chunks, how do you eat an elephant or how do you scale a mountain step-by-step step or bite-by-bite, you can get to your goal. So every day you have a smaller goal, your journey goal, and then you get to your destination goal. But again, don't give yourself a hard time. Some people need to slow down as well, reevaluate what they want in their lives. It, it's going to be an interesting period. I mean, it, it's interesting this is all happening in spring as well. You know, a seed has to go through the muck and the mud and struggle and, uh, to get, and uses the elements and, and the nutrients from the muck and the mud to find the sunshine. So it's going to be an interesting period going forward uh, with people reevaluating. Do they enjoy being home more than they enjoy being in an office? Yeah. Do they want to do something mm-hmm. completely different? If, if they want to write a book, do they love that? I mean, look at J.K. Rowling. I use her example all the time mm-hmm. of her self-belief and believing in herself. And, and again, don't take on too much more than you can chew because, because you're, you're going to train yourself. To, you know, this is about uh, building habits as well uh, around goal setting. And, and the easier it is, certainly at the start, you know, rather than I want to climb the mountain, I didn't get there today because it doesn't take a day to climb Kilimanjaro. I, I'm never going to be able to do it. But if I walk a hundred meters, I can do that today. And you're positively reinforcing your 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 goals. And, and it's, it's, we like feeling good, right? So we're motivated by how we feel. So we do things that make us feel good or we move away from what makes us feel bad. 
towards what makes us feel good. So that's why a lot of us eat a lot of chocolate, uh, Luke. Um, yeah. You know, because it makes us feel good. We know that it's not too much chocolate we can put on weight. That makes us feel bad, but the chocolate makes us feel good. So we're motivated by what makes us feel good. So if we can link our goals into what makes us feel good, you're absolutely genius. So yeah, you're I moving towards value. I think as humans, you're constantly fighting against habits like there are creatures a habit but at, at mm-hmm. the same time we're adaptable so people have their habits in place right now and it might be going to the gym going mm-hmm. to work meeting people and yeah. all those habits are in place and now mm-hmm. they have to adapt so yeah. they adapt they have to create new habits in, in the new yeah, environment well, uh, well rather than create new habits and i do a lot of work on habits and i call it the habit loop so you've got your trigger you've got your behavior you've got your um rewards so again we're moving towards the feel good feeling we were feeling beans all that kind of thing so th- what they found is it's really hard to break a habit so rather than break it we can change so we're triggered by something so rather than the behavior then comes from the trigger so rather than the, getting rid of the trigger, which is really tough because it's back here in the basal ganglia, it's been there for a long time, we change the behavior. So now you're going to be triggered by something. And instead of the behavior being, I'm going to the gym, what can you do? Maybe you'll train your back garden or maybe you, I use a cigarette, uh, people who smoke, and this is no judgment. I mean, people are entitled to do what they want as adults, of course. I don't agree with smoking. I think it has major health implications and really bad ones. But... I'm not, absolutely, there's no shame for anyone who smokes, but I do use an example of, of a smoker in an office, right? So say for instance that you're sitting in an office and the boss and all your mates and your team are going down for a cigarette break and you're not part of the group. The trigger is them leaving to go downstairs and you might find yourself going with them. The behavior is smoking, so you might find yourself smoking and the reward is well, what's the reward? And, and different people have different rewards, but maybe you're spending time with your mates or you're spending time with your boss, you're getting an ear of the boss and that kind of thing. So how do we, we can't change the trigger because the trigger is your boss and your team going down for a cigarette. So the trigger is always going to be there, but let's change the behavior. So you're going down with them, but you're not going to smoke. You're going to, I don't know, sing a song or whistle or, or eat a carrot or that kind of thing, you know, change the behavior. So we're going to be still triggered by whatever it is that, that makes us behave the way we behave. So just change the behavior. And you should still be able to tie in the reward. So you should still be able to get the reward from that. It's like me in the morning. I, I paint after I've, I've made my pot of coffee. So the coffee is my trigger. I, I then paint is, is the behavior. And the reward is the caffeine rush or the endorphin rush or expressing myself creatively. So it's, yeah. it's an amazing time now for breaking habits that we don't, that aren't beneficial. Yeah. What we also need to remember is everything that we do is there for, for a purpose and, and it's kept us safe. So all of our behaviors, so don't give ourselves a hard time if we have these habits that we now want to change. They've all, they've served a positive purpose in our lives to keep us safe or our belief systems, our value systems. We can't give ourselves a hard time about them, but if we want to move on and we want to achieve different things, we might need to look at changing some of those. But again, giving ourselves a hard time is the wrong thing to do. So where we are right now is, is the best people that we can be at this moment in time. A lot of people give themselves a hard time, and then it kind of, it's a, a negative feedback loop then, then they say, okay, yeah. well, well, this is who I am anyway, so I'll just continue to do this. <laughs> yeah, and, that, and that's a limiting belief. And, yeah. and we would challenge the belief system. And, and I mean, our beliefs change all the time. <laughs> Recently, I, I was chatting to, and it was around Christmas time, and I can't, you know, who knows who's going to listen to this age range. But anyway, we had different beliefs about different times in our lives and different things that happened at different stages. But I was talking to this a woman who was a friend of mine, and I didn't realize her kids were in the back, and I was about to talk about beliefs around Christmas time, that kind of thing. I think yeah. you guys know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Our beliefs can change and do change all the time. Um, I, I have a great tool in, in my workbook and I, I uh, give to people when, when they're doing workshops with me. What were you, your beliefs around love, um, career, money, finance, your future when you were five to 10, 10 to, to 15? You can see even now thinking about it, how they've changed 15 to 20, 20 plus. And then what beliefs you want in the future when you're 45, 50, 55, 60. So we can control our beliefs. It's just about recognizing what they are. And, and sometimes, we, we've, again, I said earlier, we're born with a blank canvas. We're not born with our beliefs or our values. We learn them from the people around us, from our experiences, 
but we can change them. So, so yeah, belief systems can hold us back or propel us forward. And this is, we have such a, such an opportunity now for some introspection anyway, if we're going to be spending huge, more time. Huge amount. Yeah, yeah. And I think you touched on something a few minutes ago about maybe this is something that I've been thinking about, Mark, as well. Uh, I think once people get a taste of having the autonomy, it's going to be hard to get them back in into the, the, the office kind of nine to five. This is when you take your break. This is when you, you know, and maybe this might be a revolution that we're going through now where it's kind of changing the paradigm, changing the how people are working. Like I know I'm a, most of the time uh, I'm more productive if I work from home anyway. Um, sure. But now, and I do, but I'm a very social person as well. So I really do miss the office. I like the, you know, talk to people at the coffee machine and that type sure. of thing, you know, <laughs> or just you know, <laughs> random people and have a chat. So I do miss that element. Um, but I think this might be an opportunity for people to ask themselves as well. How do they want to design their life? You know, mm-hmm. something that you don't have to, if you're happier working at home, if you're spending, enjoying spending some time with your kids, um, maybe a little bit too much time right now, but something mm-hmm. to keep in mind. Um, oh, this is it, guys. This period of time is, is look, I, and I again preface all of these things with a lot of people are going to suffer, and I get that, mm-hmm. but it's such a gift as well. This is a gift of a time where we can stay home. We can say, okay, what do I want? Not even we can stay home. We have to stay home. What do I want in my life? Am I doing what makes me happy? Do I feel fulfilled? If I, w- I was to do anything in the future, what would it be? It's such yeah. a time for for reflecting on, on our past or where we've come from. It's an amazing time. It, it is such a gift. And it's times like this that really propel us forward. It's like me when I was, I was so sick in, in 2017 that I really realized I had to talk to myself and shake myself and said, what do you want in your life? Have you done or fulfilled your potential? The, the things you know you can do, have you done it? And I hadn't. Time like, times like this, the whole world is going to be looking at it pretty much and saying, am I doing it? I think it's going to be an amazing, if we choose to change for the positive, for the benefit of the world, I think it's going to be incredible for the future. Absolutely. So I think we've actually covered loads of stuff that I wanted to cover as well. And I love this, this <laughs> type of podcast where it's just bouncing around and there's no, like, there's not kind of a hard structure because it's, it's the way we just talk as humans anyway. Uh, sure. But Mark, uh, we're coming to that time again for the lightning round here. Yeah. Stephen, <laughs> Mark, talking about this, Steve. Yeah, good stuff. Um, okay, so qu- some quick fire questions. So try be as 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 the first thing that comes to your head. I'm, I'm sure. Okay. I'm sure it'll be fine. Some are, I'll start off nice and easy, right? Just sure. what what apps do you use on your phone? The oh, most? I've taken a lot of apps off my phone. I use actually Coinbase, eToro. Um, I use Strava. I, uh, I kind of bounce Instagram on and off. Um, what else do I use? WhatsApp. Uh, my I've taken a lot of stuff off my phone, so pretty much the oh, I streamline my apps because I don't like I. A tip for people: allow people into your life to contact you when you have time to allow them to contact you. So when you have time, when you've given yourself all the time you need, then you can answer your emails because they're going to be there. You can answer your text messages. You can answer your WhatsApp groups. Um, yeah, so limit your access to those things because you'll have no time. You'll get nothing done if you're allowing everybody to take up all of your time. And then you'll, 20 years from now, you'll say, oh, I wonder why I didn't get anything done. Everyone else has achieved loads of great things because you're giving everyone else your time. So yeah, I'm really strict on, on what times and how I, I manage my time. I give it to me first. And, and I think the last couple of weeks have really shown how negative uh, social media can be you know, people are panicking and, and it's just coming at them. I, I can't yeah. go on Twitter anymore because it's just. Oh, I'm gone from Twitter. It's, it's uh, a nonsense. It's a mm. cesspit. And, and usually I would argue in favor. Well, I, I find balance in, in social media. Absolutely. Twitter is about the only one because it allows me to reach people all over the world. And I can see the positive and negative. Twitter is the only one I will argue against because I think it brings out the worst in people. I don't understand why. Mm. Maybe it's because they have so few characters who explode at the I don't know I just brings out the worst I believe in people if there's, so don't an, tweet anymore. If there's an app that can take out the negativity or block negative uh, tweets that, that'd that be a good app I think <laughs> I like it um, well, a, a new question that we kind of came up with was actually what uh, what apps have you deleted in the last say six six months or so um, you mentioned so a few there. Instagram was deleted yesterday and reinsert. I pop it up and down depending on what I'm doing. So 
in and out of, of Instagram. What have I deleted? Um, see, I haven't had anything on um, in quite a while that I, yeah. Oh, maybe some of my Just Eats and my Uber Eats. They're gone as well. Nice. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> the yeah. type of, like... no, again, no judgment. But yeah. I, yeah. I tell you what, I, the, Camille, I... the Camille app crashed last night. I was trying to order some crispy chicken. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Are you yeah i think they're 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 providing the drone service as well that'd be that'd be handy amazing um, amazing yeah okay what what's the best business idea you never acted upon yet um i i can't think of any i i kind of do now certainly um before i got sick i didn't push myself enough but i was in the business in the industry uh, as a visual artist but now uh, I'm kind of acting on everything I, I want to do in different respects. Like I have loads going on. I've, I've, like even politics, I wanted to get involved in politics and I, I did. Um, yeah, I put myself out there for everything. Yeah, uh, I've, yeah, I've lots of stuff happening in the background that, that we didn't cover. So lots going on. Very good. Um, what time do you get up at in the morning and what time do you go to sleep at night? So I used to be really early and I, uh, you know, I used to think I was great because I got up at 5 a.m. Now I've realized that it doesn't matter what time you get up at once you're productive, once you get the work done. So you get good up at two o'clock in the afternoon. I don't recommend it, but if that's your circadian, circadian rhythm, that's yours. You know, for me, I used to force myself up, up at five. I do my gratitude journal. I I'd, I'd journal. I'd read a book. I'd go to CrossFit uh, for 6.30. I'd be home. I'd pretty much have my day done. And then I'd, I'd get more work done, of course, after that. But I'd I'd be had I'd have so much done by nine, ten o'clock. Whereas now uh, it, it varies. It could be eight o'clock, could be nine o'clock, depending on my dogs. Um, whenever they wake me up. Nice. Um. Hmm. How much money is enough money? For me. Yeah. Or, or in general. Or in general. Um, or, or yeah. Money's kind of funny thing. It you know it it is beneficial. It does help with a lot of things, but it's not the most important thing at all. How much is enough? Um, I I talk about money, and a lot of people have limiting beliefs around money, and it holds them back a lot of the time. And if they could move that belief or limiting belief that too much money or, or you're mean if you're rich or all those kind of things, if they could move that away. They would really hit their goals a lot of the time. What I say to people who find it challenging to have a lot of money is if you make a lot of money, you can donate a lot of money. I, I was working with someone recently and I do some one-on-one -on -one work. Um, not so much because it takes up a lot of time, but she had a lot of, she does a lot of incredible work in terms of charity work, but she had a hang up about money because she thought she'd be mean if she, and I said, well, you're not mean now. Why would you be mean? Money is only a tool that you can now use. You don't have to keep in your bank account to fund the charities that you do so much work for now. So, so how much money is, is too much money? Ah, I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm happy and comfortable and I don't really think about money too much, to be honest. So what I do, is, there, are no, uh, there are no pockets in coffins is the phrase that always pops into my head. What I'm doing is, is greater than money. I think yeah I think as long as you you cover your the 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 hierarchy of needs type of thing and then mm -hmm. anything above that is yeah is, is I mean Maslow pops into it of course um, yeah. it's everything but yeah I mean I'm very comfortable I'm I'm yeah I'm very yeah cool um what do you fear getting to a point in my life where I'm on lying on my bed this is why you know a lot of people talk to me now about the current crisis that we're going through and people are wondering why i'm so easy going about it all because i've nearly died and it, it has toughened me up i fear getting to a point in my life where i'm going to possibly die and regret like i almost did that is the only thing dying without achieving all that i know i can achieve that's it. Nothing else scares me. This crisis does not scare me. There's nothing scary about it. People will, will die, of course, and it's challenging. A lot of people will suffer, but we'll get through it in the vast majority of cases and we'll grow from it. And before long, we'll have moved on to something else. So it's about taking control of our lives. And yeah, so I fear dying in regret. That that's that's the second time we've had that answer. Yeah. Okay, wow. Yeah. Luke, your, your background's fall, falling off the wall there. 
people are, <laughs> even the, the chick is up here it's not a real studio <laughs> I, it still looks great <laughs> I wouldn't have noticed if, if, if Mark hadn't have told me <laughs> Mark has very uh, you know an eye for detail <laughs> <laughs> now it's really really falling down <laughs> really falling down yeah I'll get to that I well, have one more Mark and then I'll fix this uh, studio that is oh. like, like, okay. okay as as always when you say one more I'll say two more right is it is it who you know or what you know? It is, uh, it depends on what you're talking about. Now, I do know why people use both of those phrases. I would say for getting anything done, the most important thing is what you know, or, but not even what you know, how you, how, what you do rather than what you know. So you can know everything, but if you don't do anything, you're going to know everything and die doing nothing. So it's about action and taking action, really important. Who you know, does that help? Well, yeah, of course it does. And we're back to being tribal and why we like our, our small communities. And, and of course, if, if I'm in your organization, you're probably going to help me over the person that you don't know who comes in and says, Mark, will you give me a hand with this? You're probably going to say, I'm sure you'd, you'd help that person, but not as quickly as you'd help the person who you know. So uh, both are important, but it's what you do with what you know. I like that. With the people you know. Okay. If you, if you could advise someone to learn one skill, what would it be? Say the 18 year old, Stephen. Creative expression, expressing yourself creatively, creative thinking, so important for innovation, for anything, going forward, being creative, thinking outside of the box. And I know a lot of people are saying, well, what box? What are you talking about? If you're inside an enclosed box and you're not thinking outside of it, you're not going to grow. Creativity. A lot of people tend to say, oh, I'm not creative. I, I can't do this. I can't. But there's so many different That's ways. A nonsense there is. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. We're all creative beings. And, and I love how the, the ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans would have viewed creativity. And we had tie ego into it and a lot of vulnerability into it. And, and it's of us. But the ancient Greeks and Romans believed that it was from a divine source, that we were merely the conduits, that it was passed to us by a daemon or a muse. And that took a lot of the ego out of it. So rather than it be from me, and I'm the artist putting myself out there, I'm not creative. It's a divine source that is filling me with a fire that I'm now creating. And imagine this. I mean, we've all been moved by a piece of music or, or a piece of poetry, maybe, or a movie. A singer, a song that has moved us to action or, or made us happy or sad. Our creativity can do that for other people. I mean, it's the greatest gift of all, creativity. And we all are creative. If you ask a group of kids, your daughter is eight. If you ask her whole class, are they, crea are they creative? I guarantee you every single one of them will put their hand up, yeah. apart from the teacher. The teacher may not. The teacher might say, oh, I'm not, because they've been beaten down maybe or told they're not good enough or, or have limiting beliefs about their creative expression. But again, it's, Picasso said it took him five years to learn how to paint like a master, and I'm paraphrasing, but it took him 45 years to learn how to create as a child or to draw or paint as he did as a child. So it's about being creative like a child, basically, and having a child's mind in terms of creativity. It's so important. It's Very so good. important as well because people, like, they say they're not creative. Like, they were born to create things. It's there. Like, everyone, mm -hmm. you have that part of your... Everything's a creation. Yeah, everything's a creation. But there is, the, Stephen, there is this thing when people aren't so... I will, I'm not an artist, but the even... This, this isn't, like, a, if the podcast here is not art but it's a, it is a creation that we kind of came up with the shark Absolutely, it is an art <laughs> but i remember the first time we were going to publish this and we were going to hit you know upload and i was just like uh oh. you know i mean i got a you know that, that kind of like a resistance to say you know what are people going to think this is like you know yes that's <laughs> it i was going to say to you what what was going through your head i just thought people would just be picking bits out of it you know i had i know but it was just something that and how do you know how do you know what people think? How do you know what I'm thinking now? I could tell you I think it's all brilliant, and it is, and I believe that. But you don't know I'm thinking that. So rather than think I'm thinking something negative, just imagine I'm thinking something positive. Yeah, exactly. This is what the message we need to get out to the, the other sharks out there. Because um, uh, also, when we did this, uh, we've had nothing but positive uh, the feedback. Mm -hmm. People will look think off your boys, you, mark if you, know. <laughs> you, you won't even know the people that you're going to help with this. There are people around, the, the, the people, some people will tell you, but the vast majority won't tell you, but you'll change their lives. That's what it's about. It's about giving tools to people, helping them out, and the ripple effect that happens from that. It's amazing. You'll never know. And, and if you'd held it in, if you hadn't pressed uh, play or, or published that day, 
you wouldn't have helped the people that you undoubtedly will help going forward. I mean, there are people who are going to be listening to you, looking up to you and trying to, to emulate you maybe or listen to a, a tip from one of the people who you have on. You're helping people. It's amazing. It's such a gift. And it is, it's incredibly creative. And just don't worry about what people think unless you imagine they're thinking something really good. Okay. So <laughs> I'm going to fall in there. On that. I'd like to thank you, Stephen, for giving, you so much, giving us so much of your time here today thank on you. the weekend. I know we're all stuck at home and uh, we have to make do here, but I think it was brilliant. I love, I love the story of, uh, of trying not to uh, regret uh, what, what's, what's coming for all of us in the end, right? So it's something that we need to think about a little bit more, not in a negative way, but in a way that can inform our, our decisions and the, mm -hmm. the actions that we take today. Um, so Mark, uh, thanks very much for your time as well. I know uh, we do this every Saturday, but it's great to <laughs> thank you on things as well. Um, so we're going to tidy this up in post, but thank you very much, Stephen, for giving us all your time. And uh, thank you. where can people find you actually before we, before we jump off? So um, website you mentioned earlier, I've actually got two. So I've got stephenfarrell.ie, Stephen with a V, and I've stephenmannionfarrell.com. Mannion was my pre-married name, actually. Farrell was my, my post-married name. Okay. And then I've got my Instagram, stephen underscore farrell11, and then I have various different places. And the Stephen Farrell podcast is, is where you'll, you'll hear me more. And then, and then clients and people who would be, you know, you'd be helping. What type of, what type of people would that be, our, our companies? Yeah, so I'm represented, uh, recently uh, been taken on by one of the biggest speaker agents in the world, a place so called that, yeah. APB, so American Program Bureau, APB speakers based out in Boston, and they're the biggest speaker celebrity entertainment agencies in the world. Cool. So that was recent, and then all of this happened. But look, I'm going to grow from it. Actually, it's, a, it's an amazing time to fine stream my, my speech. I also paint in my talk, so I'm a speed painter as well. So it adds a bit of an element of, of you're not getting the regular speaker, it's something different, a bit more fun, engaging, entertaining. Huh. And I also get my my audiences to do a bit of work so if I can. So I I do a I use a metaphor of drawing a horse to work on your goals. So how do you draw the horse? And a lot of people say they can't and I get them to do it in two minutes and then they realize it, it they can use it as a tool for well, that's a goal I didn't think I could do. And in two minutes, I did it. So step by step, this is how I do it. That's so brilliant. yeah, I, mm -hmm. I love it. After look, I'm so blessed, guys. I'm so blessed. I nearly, two and a half years ago, I nearly died. So I'm, I'm ah, look, life is amazing. Life is amazing. Mark, I'll see you soon. Uh, Stephen, best of luck with everything that you're doing. Thank you so much. I'll be uh, listening in your podcast, uh, no doubt as well. Hopefully. I'll see you guys. Thanks, Thanks Stephen. Thanks, Luke. <laughs> Happy <laughs> birthday as well in advance. Yeah, absolutely. You might you might we're 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 birthday buddies. We're right. thinking about you. <laughs> Thanks guys.